so uh, to give to foreground this a little bit, um, I'm talking about, uh, well, actually, no, I'll get into definitions. Hi, welcome to my presentation. Um, today I'm telling you about, I'm talking about uh, the work involved in producing uh, actual play media, uh, which centers around a kind of gaming called RPGs, um, or as I'll be referring to them here, TRPGs. Uh, the short version of what TRPGs are is that they're a form of analog gaming, so they're not video games, and they work largely by playing pretend and using rules in order to tell a story um, and uh, introducing elements of chance or moderation, things like dice, uh, in order to add elements of unpredictab pr um, unpredictability and emergence to that story. Um, if you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, uh, it is the sort of prototypical RPG and still the most popular. Uh, actual play is a form, is a sort of transmedia genre encompassing both things like podcasts, some written formats, and um, live streams, um, which uh, focuses on uh, live and unscripted, um, or rather unscripted um, recordings of play sessions. Um, its appeal lies both in the play itself and in the charisma and per uh, performing abilities of uh, the players. Um, it has also had a massive and transformative effect on the culture and industry of tabletop role-playing games more broadly. Um, my dissertation focuses on actual play um, as an important uh, cultural mediator in RPGs. Uh, it sees AP production uh, as a crucial process of mediation in the production and reproduction of TRPG culture, bringing together new technologies and pre-existing communities of play in new industries and forms of labor. Um, my analysis builds on over a dozen semi-structured qualitative group and individual interviews with AP product producers, and that's a number I hope to double by the end of this calendar year. Um, I focalize labor as key, but also acknowledge uh, deep uh, ambiguities in dealing of questions with la of labor when so many of the participants are not professionalized, um, and therefore draw upon Tiziana Terranova's insight that labor is not equivalent to wage labor and that its productivity can be understood beyond um, its uh, embarkation in questions of compensation, for instance, or its uh, relationship to uh, the traditional structures of capitalism. Uh, that isn't to say those are not, um, that isn't to say those questions are discounted, um, but rather that um, they, they cannot provide a complete enough picture for my purposes. Uh, I rather draw upon um, David Hall and Sarah Baker's framework of uh, normative judgments of good uh, good work uh, and ask whether the work of producing AP is, AP is good. That is, I investigate what AP producers are able to accomplish and the conditions under which those accomplishments are possible. And I try to hold off on accusations of false conscience and cultural and cultural dupery. Um, among, among other things, AP exemplifies how new articulations of technological capitalism extract value from novel fusions of work and pleasure, but they also form the bases upon which such fusions are possible. Uh, and so to better understand these dynamics, I approach my interviews from four key perspectives, which I'll be outlining and, and you know, fleshing out in this presentation. Uh, those perspectives are passionate production, semi-professionalism, creativity and craft, and labor capture. Uh, and so I'll be going through each of those in order and talking about what they've brought to my analysis. Uh, the first of these is passionate labor. Uh, passionate labor combines perspectives in fan studies and political economy, uh, understanding AP production as motivated by a desire to participate in fan communities, engage with fanish objects, and partake in playful activities. AP is almost always a kind of fan creation. First and foremost, it creates opportunities for fanish engagement with TRPG products. Um, each, sorry, uh, each series will tell its own story, but the rules are always a part of it. Um, and therefore, there's always a product involved. Uh, one participant reflected that they launched their actual play series as a kind of accountability system in order to ensure that they would play a new RPG adventure product uh, from a publisher that they love all the way through, uh, demonstrating the sort of the, the place of fandom in creating these things. Um, my participants also uh, discuss the modeling function of their play, uh, whereby viewers interested in how to play RPGs with a certain system or just in general could learn from watching or listening to their play. And multiple participants explicitly mention teaching, empowering, or encouraging new players as a primary objective of their series. Um, furthermore, many TRPG systems are designed to allow players to play in the worlds of various licensed intellectual properties, creating opportunities to play in beloved fictional worlds. 
My participants discuss playing games in the worlds of Star Trek, Star Wars, Alien, and various anime series. AP thereby enables multiple layers of fanish engagement beyond the, you know, beyond the playing of the game. Beyond these fanish aspects, this, this perspective acknowledges the obvious fact that AP involving, involves playing games and playing games is fun. Many of my participants frame the fact of recording their play as unrelated to or even enhancing their enjoyment of the game with many remarking that they would not stick with AP otherwise. Indeed, the minimal, te minimal technical requirements and material demands of RPG play make it easy to record keeping AP's barrier, uh, entry barriers low. Um, participants, including those producing AP for a living, also see it as a source of bonding with their friends and a welcome time apart from more serious responsibilities. So there's two, on the point of semi-professionalism, there are two things to emphasize. The first is that AP is widely monetized. Uh, many series offer supplemental materials, on-air shoutouts, or access to exclusive fan spaces as incentives for donations or paid subscriptions. Uh, the second salient point here is that the vast majority of AP series are not profitable. Uh, this perspective examines the way AP is paradoxically professionalized or the extent to which AP production becomes a job. This perspective underlines the role of professional and market logics in AP production, entailing processes of labor formalization, capital investment, and skilling. Uh, professionalism takes many forms in AP, from quality of play to performance, editing, and promotion. Indeed, many producers actively promote their series on social media, a task which they widely report to be onerous but necessary. Uh, even hobbyist producers regularly purchase high-end equipment and software for a more professional product. It is also common for producers to be members of specialized communities on social media that help them develop their series and technical skills, as well as providing resources and promotional coverage. The urge to produce professional quality work is driven, at least in part, by a desire to attract and retain audiences amid a field of producers that is increasingly perceived as overcrowded and dominated by a handful of highly popular, expensively produced series, and informs a number of creative and executive decisions. Nevertheless, the fanish and playful aspects of AP drive a desire to keep the work from becoming too much like a job, and even for the um, and this is the case even for those for whom it is a job. The work of organizing, recording, editing, promoting, and monetizing play can easily outweigh its pleasures. Less professionalized participants were divided as to whether they would be willing to take up AP as their primary occupation if it were profitable enough, and participants at all levels of professionalization described acts of delegation, pacing, and scaling back in order to prevent the work from overtaking their play. Given that so few participants intend to become full-fledged professionals, why is professionalism so important? Well, in my interviews, it was tied into efforts both to share their work and to monetize it. AP is costly in terms of time, energy, and capital. Many of these participants claim that although these costs are not prohibitive, they are significant enough to motivate efforts to try and break even. For participants interested in pursuing uh, creative careers, uh, their AP series could stand as a portfolio piece or simply a safe environment to hone their skills. For many of those for whom AP presents a genuine shot at a living, also, um, those people also operate within a tight cluster of producers based in Los Angeles, where they enjoy a significant degree of capital investment and access to resources and talent from the Hollywood and TV industries. Um, or else they're able to leverage pre-existing audiences to rapidly develop a following. Indeed, there's a massive gap in professional connections and resources between the majority of AP producers and the most successful. I characterize AP labor as, as semi-professionalized because its professional trappings are widely taken up, yet rarely complete or, significant or sufficient to make a career. Um, the third perspective here is creativity and craft. It builds on Daniel Sennett's theorization of the craftsperson and theorizations of creative community and communities of practice. This perspective underscores the intrinsic pleasures of AP production apart from questions of fandom and play, and instead focalizes intensive and sometimes monotonous effort as a channel for expression, personal development, and initiation into communities of learning. That is to say that playing games is not the only source of pleasure and that the technical aspects are not purely to professional ends. Many editors describe becoming engrossed in their work and enjoying finding ways to enrich and polish their final product. One podcaster remarked that they enjoyed the sense of control afforded by audio editing and also the opportunity to take time out of their busy life to focus on such a detail-oriented task. Indeed, a number of editors reflected that editing allowed them to indulge their perfectionism to the point that several described having to delegate or let go of the practice because it was becoming obsessive. Producers with creative backgrounds in acting and storytelling reflected that AP allowed them to experiment with and share characters and stories that other formats could not afford. For passionate game masters, which is an aspect of playing role-playing games and a very skillful one, um, AP offers opportunities to practice running games, and a couple game masters mentioned enjoying the ego boost from knowing there was a record of their play. Uh, as I already mentioned, AP producers often join into communities of practice. Um, these communities help them develop their skills and therefore serve as sites of transmission of knowledge of craft. 
There are also sites where practitioners express support and encouragement and develop effective bonds beyond a kind of um, practice-based solidarity. Participants in my study identified membership in these communities as one of the pleasures of their work, and one remarked that they were motivated to continue producing podcasts so that they would not lose touch with their network. Uh, finally, creativity is clearly valuable to AP producers. Um, uh, despite the outsized role of some major series, like for instance, Critical Role in influencing tastes for AP, um, many reported that they were not willing to change their play style in order to reach a larger audience. Uh, the expressive qualities of play remain too important to be compromised in the name of professionalism beyond certain limits. Uh, finally, labor capture. So this one pivots away from these more producer oriented, um, these more subjective um, frameworks and instead uh, looks at how out wide actors are um, extracting labor uh, from these people's work. Uh, significantly, it underscores the ways in which AP generates significant value for, the, for those other actors, while only a fraction of that value is compensated to the producers. Uh, first and foremost, AP has been a massive boon to the tabletop role playing game industry. Um, it's generated a huge influx of new players. Um, and it serves as a great source of free advertising uh, because it not only shows off the attractive aspects of RPGs, such as their playfulness and narrativity, but uh, showcases their rules and pairs them with entertaining and charismatic performances. Um, the, per the publishers of Dungeons and Dragons, Wizards of the Coast are in fact active on the Los Angeles actual play scene uh, and regularly collaborate with streamers there to amplify their brand, offering money and early access to new products. Um, it's been equally beneficial though for in independent RPG producers uh, who can now turn to actual play producers uh, to provide them with promotional coverage that they simply couldn't access otherwise. Um, it's also created, uh, or no, sorry, I just read that part. Um, finally, uh, AP produces massive amounts of vo volume for various plat web platforms such as uh, websites that sell RPGs, um, websites that distribute their work such as YouTube and Twitch, um, but also uh, for many of their monetization systems, uh, such as Patreon. Um, Patreon is a major source of funding for both podcasters and streamers and takes a, um, a share of all of their revenues gained through that platform. Uh, because of its tiered subscription model, it also incentivizes producing additional content in order to offer higher priced tiers, uh, including sharing game artifacts and notes, as well as audio commentary. But some streamers were going as far as producing, or one streamer was going as far as producing a weekly on game stream with um, some of their higher paying patrons in order to incentivize uh, that level of buy in. Um, my participants were largely aware of the various types of exploitation and monetization that were happening outside of their reach, but also broadly ambivalent to those dynamics. Um, these outside actors that stand to benefit from AP also create opportunities to recoup costs, reach audiences, improve the series, and even turn a profit. These attitudes are unsurprising when one considers the extent to which AP has emerged as an affordance of these very services and tools. Um, to wrap up, um, so in AP, we witnessed the eruption of new technologies and communications of capture that form the bases for novel forms of expression, community, and new personal and vocational pathways. At the same time, they channel, energize, and expand extant communities of play whose activities have been marginalized for most of their existence. For many producers not interested in going professional, the monetization of their labor by other parties is not a serious problem or indeed stands as an opportunity. Its practitioners are aware of its constitutive tensions between work and play, hobby and profession, democratization and hierarchization, and navigate these thoughtfully and according to their own aims. The passionate aspects of play are universally treasured and few even on the more professional end of the spectrum are willing to pursue profit at the expense of creative satisfaction. Likewise, its value as a source of capital for producers and intermediaries, and despite deep equalities and pathways to profitability, AP is amply productive in terms of recuperation, social bonds, collective experience, various cultural goods, and development of self. Uh, that brings me to my, the end of my presentation. Thank you all.